finished up this morning. Um, just a couple of announcements. We Emissions is doing an alphabet food drive. I've also been told that they would gladly accept personal care items. So starting with the first letter of your first or last name, bring in items to support them this summer. Um, we're getting excited about VBS, which is happening at the end of this month, the 27th through the 30th. If you would like to volunteer, they're still looking for some people. See Tracy Bartels. And just a reminder that uh, Gwen's celebration of her over 50 years of service here is next Sunday, the 25th, after this worship service. If you would like to sign up to attend and to bring something, uh, sign up online or call the church office. All the other announcements I will leave to you from the screen or in the newsletter or on social media. Please stand and join me for the call to worship. As early followers of Jesus gathered for fellowship and worship, praying and singing and reading the scriptures, so we gather this morning. We read in Acts that the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul. One heart, one soul. They shared everything. Everything they owned, everything they had. God's grace was at work in them. Powerfully at work within them all. There was not a needy person among them. May it be so for us as well. Amen. Please remain standing for our opening hymn.
be seated. As we go into our offering prayer, I would remind you that the offering can be placed in the back there. Those online can click on the link to give your offering and remember that even during these summer months that your church still continues to exist. Please contribute to the missions that we do here. Please join me in prayer. Lord, as the apostles gave of themselves to you and your work, mind, body, and possessions, help us to give ourselves to you, knowing that all we have comes from you. Mighty God, with your powerful arms, hold up your church. We are struggling through tough times in our churches. We need to be renewed again and filled with your power. Reach inside us and open our hearts wide so that we might give the full measure of our devotion. Bless these gifts and those who give them. In the holy name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, choir. What a beautiful lead-in for the prayers of the people. Please join me in prayer. Lord, today we pray for our church, 
for all Christians everywhere, for our bishop, for our clergy as they return home for annual conference, for those newly ordained, including our own Catherine Sherrill, for our congregation here at Harrisburg United Methodist. Gracious God, may your spirit give strength to all your people as they work and witness in your world. Unite us in your truth and love and help us show your love to others. We pray for all people, for places where there is war or famine. God, our creator, help everyone to share all the good gifts you have given to us. May those who lead the nations of the world be given wisdom. God, our friend, we pray for our families and friends. May we be able to help each other just as you love and help us. We pray for those in need, for those who are sick, for those in the hospital, and for those with any other issues that require your loving healing touch. Compassionate God, gift your strength and healing to those who are sad, lonely, or sick, and bless all those who try and help them. We remember all those who have died. God of hope, we thank you that not even death can separate us from your love. We pray for all those who mourn, that they may feel your care for them. We pray for ourselves and all that we will do this week and all those we will meet. Loving God, we give this week into your hands. Be with us in all that we will do. May we enjoy this week and learn and grow in it. Those things, O oh God, that your servants have prayed for, give us grace to work for. And in the purpose of your love, answer our prayers and fulfill our hopes for Jesus' sake, as we pray, as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. scripture reading today comes from Romans chapter 5 verses 1 through 8 hear the word of the Lord therefore since we are justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God and not only that but we also boast in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not disappoint us because god's love has been poured into our hearts through the holy spirit that has been given to us for while we were still weak at the right time christ died for the ungodly indeed rarely will anyone die for a righteous person Though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the word of God for all people. Amen. Thanks be to God. Now, please stand as we sing our second hymn. <clears throat>
I invite you to be seated. This morning it is uh, my uh, privilege to bring you a message from the scriptures and that continues to go with our Bible school theme of change makers, that God is calling us to change this world around us. And so my name is Richard Smith. I am the pastor of families and students here at Harrisburg United Methodist Church and warmly welcome all of you who are with us this morning. And if you're visiting with us online, we warmly welcome you and glad you are a part of our service this morning. We have uh, lots of things happening today and uh, a couple things need to shout out. First of all, uh, I know Kara has been here all morning and she's kind of snuck out the back door so I can talk about her all I want to now. But uh, you, you never know what you get yourself into when you get on a church staff. I mean, she was really out of her comfort zone this morning, but she did not say no. And it was fantastic to see her grow by coming and leading you because she said she was a little intimidated and, and yeah, some of you people are very intimidating, but uh, <laughs> you know, God's a big God. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, if you guys, uh, when it comes to leading in worship and, and we're just so proud of Kara and, and then what she's added to our church staff, very knowledgeable about things going on, picks things up so quick and just was great, great help this morning. Secondly, uh, in the way of reminders of things, today is, uh, we're going, this week, tomorrow is, is Juneteenth, is when we celebrate uh, the, the emancipation of slaves in America. It happened a long time ago, and we haven't made a big deal about it, but it's more and more, we are becoming more and more equal. We still have a long way to go to be people that warmly welcome each other, regardless of where we come from or skin color and things like that. But we are making progress. And we want to celebrate that uh, as we uh, celebrate it in the church, as well as we celebrate that tomorrow with a lot of folks being out of work, which should be fun. And the third thing is, what's the obvious thing today? Father's, Father's Day. Day. Yes, Father's Day. So I am richly blessed that my father came to see me from the coast. And so, uh, and my father-in-law is back there too. So we're going to have a big celebration. And not everyone is a biological father, but there are a ton of male men out there who act like fathers to children and young people who need them uh, or influence someone else's young person. Because sometimes when, especially when they're teenagers, as we well know, they grow deaf for some reason to their own parents talking to them. Um, and if you're not there yet, you will be. So it's great to have other people talking and speaking into their lives. And so many of you do that in so many different ways. So we want to celebrate the influence that men have on young people and other people in their lives. Because it's so, so important. Uh, we have several here that, uh, that have grown kids of their own. But I love seeing how they interact with our young people and the way they encourage and the way they hold them accountable in appropriate ways. So it's a good thing. So happy Father's Day to everyone. And uh, may it be a lot of fun. Now, at the early service, if you heard, I uh, invited in those of you fathers who did not have families or homes to go to for lunch, you're welcome to come to our house. We're going to have a big party over there. Uh, we'll have plenty of food. Uh, I didn't let my wife know that I invited everybody at the early service. But I did give her a heads up for this service. And she says, everybody's welcome. So if you need a place to have lunch and to celebrate, then you're more than welcome to come and celebrate with us. I spent all day smoking my first brisket yesterday, so I got some vic victims, I mean some family coming over to, uh, to try it and see how it goes. So. With that, for those of you who are able, I invite you to stand as we read our, our scripture this morning from the book of Acts. <coughs> Acts 2, 42 through 47 and 4, 32 through 37. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and they had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and their goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day they spent much time together in the temple they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Now the whole group 
of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what they sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. There was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that belonged to him and then brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. This is the word of God for all people. I invite you to be seated. <coughs> this morning, as we look at the scriptures, and as I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, I mean, this has always been one of those, one of those scriptures that has always kind of stuck with me, and it's even gotten me in some trouble sometimes, uh, because of the kind of life that that New Testament church was doing, sharing everything and people bringing money to the apostles and they could distribute it. It sounds a little bit more like a, a different kind of government than the way we live in the United States. In the United States, we are basically ba uh, focused on consumerism and the more we consume, the better off everybody is. I mean, that's kind of, of, of our attitude sometimes. And so I'm gonna try not to get myself into too much trouble, but I am gonna talk a little bit about this community in the New Testament and in a little bit in comparison of who we are and maybe what God could possibly do, which, you know, sometimes we limit God, God's ability to act because we don't believe that there can be real change, that we don't actually believe that things can be different from the way they are. I love these scriptures because there's a really simple formula for how all that took place. And we want to go back and read it through the eyes of Jesus is trying to create a different kind of community. But I don't think that was the intention of the Acts Church, was to be intentionally different. Oh, we're going to go off and we're going to put all our stuff together. I think it was more of a result of God moving in people's lives than one of those intentional communities. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that this morning. Most of us, again, read these verses with Jesus trying to do something or with the new church trying to do something, but uh, I think there's a little more to it than that. Our problem with our society is that we live uh, with this attitude of, of the, uh, the seagulls from the movie Finding Nemo. You guys remember Finding Nemo, little kid's movie? Mine, 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 mine. Oh, that still sticks to me every day. Every time a kid is fighting over something like the game or something in the room, whatever, mine, 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 mine. You know, like, uh, and it's, it talks about, um, you know, everything is mine. I mean, I have a nice house. I have a car. I have two dogs. And, you know, I have this, I have that. And, and we take a lot of pride and we have a lot of stuff. When Amy and I first moved into our home, here in, uh, in the Harrisburg area, up in Concord, actually. We moved from uh, a thousand square foot house. Uh, it was really tight. And we moved to a house that has almost 3,000 square feet. So we almost tripled our space. So when we moved into the house, we're like, oh my gosh, there's lots of empty rooms in this place. Uh, if you come over now, you would think I would need the third car garage. And we only have one car. So we have so much stuff. I mean, we have, Bedrooms are full. We have to like when guests come over, it takes us a week to clean all the stuff out so the guests can have their bed near in the guest bedroom. Uh, we just we just like stuff. The other day uh, before we left on our vacation, we had uh, I had to need a pair of shoes, um, and I hate shopping. I mean, it's just one of the things I've always hated. I don't like going to the store. I don't like talking to people. I guess it's pretty bad, but I don't. Um, I just don't want to go to the stores and shop, right? So online has been the, the, the savior of, of my consumer life because uh, Christmas time means I don't have to stand in line. I just get delivered to the house, you know, just order online, it's great. So you're looking for shoes and now every ad on all these platforms that I use are trying to sell me shoes. 
Alexa's got shoe ads up at the house on her whole thing. Uh, Google, every time you open up Google, it's shoe ads. Facebook, I don't know how Facebook, I mean, I, uh, I do know how, but even Facebook, I can't look out Facebook without looking at shoes. I'm like, I'm sorry, Rockport, I am not buying your shoes this time because I've already got what I wanted, you know? Uh, and it's just kind of crazy because we live in that kind of society. We want, they, the, the businesses want us to buy, 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 because uh, they're trying to sell, sell, sell. And, and so much of our time and energy is spent pursuing those kinds of things. And so what's, when we do that, then for a lot of people, that creates debt. And the average American, which I thought was kind of low, uh, has a debt of, I think, seven to $8,000 per person. But that then that's divided across the whole population. So like young people, are included in that number, even though Joey probably does not have $7,000 worth of debt, okay? Uh, that's how the, the numbers look smaller, but if you really think about family debt, it's a real common issue in so many, he doesn't want to call him out, um, in, so many, uh, in so many different ways. Uh, there's just so much to all this stuff. And so it's just, so what I'm thinking is like, when we read the scripture, especially with us being a, uh, a capitalistic society, we look at it as a threat to who we are. But I want us to look at it at a different, from a different point of view, not as a threat, but possibly something that grows out of our faith, how we can be changed and transformed by God into doing some really crazy stuff. <clears throat> I was gonna talk about the next problem with all the stuff is, well, I will talk about it real quickly. What's the next problem when we got a house full of stuff? Anybody? What do you got to do with it? Store. You got to store it. What else you got to do? You got to take care of it. And you got to protect it. You got to protect it from those people out there who want to steal. So like in our neighborhood, I don't have a ring doorbell yet, but how many of you, I'm not going to ask, have cameras and ring doorbells, that kind of stuff, watching your, your, your stuff and your property. I don't have to worry about it because I know my three neighbors across the street do. So if anybody does anything in my house, I've got three different videos, <laughs> coverages of, of what's going on, right? So. Um, so we, there's a lot of energy and um, anxiety and things like that about protecting our things, you know, uh, about the things that we have. So, so we spend a lot of time and energy uh, collecting stuff and then protecting it. Uh, and I just think about what can we do with those kinds of resources if we reapply them in different parts of our lives? Um, or maybe it's, I'm aiming, totally looking at the wrong question. Maybe our scripture is not talking about the stuff or how to use it or not to use it when we're talking about sharing everything, but maybe there's something deeper to it. Now our scripture is two, two different sections in the book of Acts that are very similar. It talks about the community, this new community that's kind of created itself after the, uh, the death and resurrection of Christ and the Holy Spirit comes in and just makes everybody wild and crazy. I mean, you think about a community that goes from like maybe 200 people counting women and men to overnight one sermon to a community of, of thousands of three to 4,000 people. And they keep preaching and they keep doing the stuff and the community keeps growing. And so what happened? How did, I mean, I, I, I just don't see the apostles thinking, um, well, I think we need to share everything people. Let's come together and do this stuff. But I think it's what grew naturally out of their excitement of seeing what God is doing in their lives. There are four parts to, this, uh, to those scriptures that if we applied, honest to goodnessly, reapplied to our lives, then our community would be definitely different. And we would be impacting so many other people. The first thing is, is that they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching. What is that for us today? What do we call that? Okay, Bible study, right? I'm not going to ask that question either. That's another other question. How many of you are reading your Bibles and doing a Bible study on a regular basis? Don't answer. I don't want to know. But <laughs> that's one thing that I believe that the church is missing. We're missing this, this love and this passion for God's Word and how it can speak to us and change us. Because it does. Like this scripture here that we're talking about this morning. They also... Uh, were intentional about their fellowship, about who they hung out with. And they hung out as, as a group all the time. What happens when you hang out with your friends and people you really like, be like, who believe like you? Do you feel bad or are you encouraged? It's an encouraging kind of thing. 
You know, uh, part of the church's job is to encourage one another. Like when people left this morning, I don't know if they meant it or not, but they said they did a good job. You know, I'm like, well, good. You're texting the mail, you're texting the mail, you're texting the mail, you know. Um, you just don't know. Uh, but you're encouraged when, and you're stronger. Uh, your faith is always stronger when you live it out together because you're not alone, which is one of the things with our society now. There's so much loneliness out there. The third thing is they spent time breaking bread. And that doesn't mean just our monthly communion on the first of the month, but that means gathering together for fellowship. Next Sunday is a fantastic opportunity for all of us to gather and party hard to celebrate a ministry that has encompassed half a century. Gwen has been at this church playing the organ and directing choir for over 50 years. I don't know any pastors who can say that. Uh, it is a time of celebration of coming together and reflecting on all the ministry that she has done and how her part has brought us all together. It's a fantastic opportunity to continue to be uh, in a part of the fellowship. And the last thing is they actually spent time praying. Uh, praying. Some of us look at that as a chore or as me this week, when the officer comes up behind you in the car and the lights are flashing, you start praying real hard then too. Um, <laughs> that's another story for another day. But you will read about that one uh, because uh, grace is an amazing thing, I'll tell you what. So, but praying other than when we're in trouble, going to God regularly in prayer, waiting for God to speak to us until, and we hear him do his thing in our hearts and our lives and changing us, it's critical. And I'll talk more about that one at the end. So those four things, devoting themselves to teaching, Bible study, teach, uh, fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers, those things are what those verses said over and over and over again. That's what made that community unique. It wasn't the fact that they shared everything, it was because of these other things that they were led and they were transformed into a community that looked out after those in the community with all that they had. Even Barnabas, the, the weird thing about Barnabas there at the end is that Barnabas was a Levite. And the Levites were of the priestly clan. That means back in the old Old Testament, they weren't you know, really to, supposed to have stuff. They weren't really, they were supposed to rely on the people because the priests came out of them and they were supposed to rely on their people for their support, their ministry and stuff. And somehow, I don't know, years, years, years later, Barnabas, one of these guys, he's not a priest because it didn't say he was, but he probably was part of the, the temple staff, you know, keeping things up or whatever. Uh, but he had a field, which was very, very unique. But he was so touched by, uh, by Christ's work and the spirit that he went and sold that field and gave the money to, uh, to the disciples. Uh, just kind of an interesting thing there. And then the, uh, the writer of Acts, Luke, he kind of does that. He kind of like slides in an introduction of somebody and a character, and you see him later on doing a lot more things. And so uh, Barnabas is, is such a, a, a good, important part of Paul and what Paul became and did. So uh, anyway, just a little Bible trivia there for you. So do you ever ask your question, yourself this question, will there be enough? I would say here, most of us probably not worried about will there be enough? But maybe we should be asking ourselves, how much is enough? But most of us, after studying and reading and thinking about these verses, I think what God is trying to do is trying to transform us into a community. This is not an experiment, this new church. They, a lot of people want to look at it as an experiment in Christianity where everybody shares everything and we live together. But I think it's just what came out of God's providence and what God was doing with these people. Um, and it wasn't something that I don't think Jesus intended, but he intends for us to live differently. Now, how can we do that in this world, in this day of time? And that's the question that we have to wrestle with because we live in a society like this uh, that's based on capitalism. How can we live as Christians within this and be filled by the presence of God where, uh, where people's lives can actually be changed and affected by the power and the presence of God? I want to look up two communities where this has been tried, uh, which I'm really uh, a big fan of. One of them is uh, Koinia Farm near a place called Americus, Georgia. 
Can anybody tell me what makes America's Georgia famous? Habitat. Habitat for Humanity, their headquarters there. Jimmy Carter was kind of, he grew up in that area. Uh, there's a place called Koinonia Farm, started back in, I think in the mid 40s or something by a guy named Clarence Jordan and another gentleman. And it was the first practice at an intentionally racially integrated community. Blacks and whites lived on this farm together as, as, as equals. Uh, everybody got equal pay, everybody did equal work, and it was a community, especially as the 60s grew closer, that was under a lot of fire. There was, uh, there was one time they burnt all the crops, one, you know, the people who were against um, the integration you know, came in and did their thing. But these people remained true to themselves, and it was, it was a, a really unique experience in, in our country. Uh, that still exists today. The farm is still there, and people, whoever, are welcome from every race, and everybody's treated equally. There isn't a hierarchy, and so it's pretty cool. And so what came out of that kind of attitude was Habitat for Humanity, um, as um, they influenced people like Jimmy Carter and others who have taken hold of, uh, of that group and provide housing for folks. There's another kind of radical community in Philadelphia. It's called The Simple Way. And it's in a rough, rough neighborhood in Philly. It's a place where you don't want to be after dark. Even still, this community has been uh, going on for about 20 years now. And this is still a, an area full of trouble, a lot of crime. There's still shootings and stuff like that there. But what they've done is that they've started with one house and they've gotten people uh, who didn't have housing, housing, got them jobs, got them off drugs and all kinds of stuff. They have all kinds of programs to help the poorest of the poor to begin to live in a new community. And one of the coolest things I read about this community was that you know they don't have a lot of money. It's a, still a very poor community. But what they do is uh, nobody can afford health insurance. I mean, I can't hardly really afford health insurance. And um, so the poor can't afford health insurance. And so what they do is they have a, for those who work, they put into a, a community bank. And if someone gets hurt or needs to go to the hospital, out of the community comes all the funds for taking care of that person's health care. And it is, it is working. It is, they have like this health care co-op kind of thing. And so everybody contributes. And then when somebody has a need, then it's taken care of, um, you know, beyond the, the government, Medicare, Medicaid kind of stuff. And so it really helps the community survive and thrive. And it is a place for those who are lost to come and to find God and find uh, what, um, find transformation. But these are radical communities that I don't propose that we need to be doing, but what I do propose is that we need to let God transform us, that we need to become more than we are right now. We look at the world around us. Our churches are in decline, people. This church is actually struggling with attendance and beginning to show a little cracks around the seams. Why is that? Why are we beginning to, why is the church in America not as nearly as effective as it was? Some of us think that it's because of how we choose not to live out our faith. We are not gathering for those four things that we talked about as we should. Sunday school here in this church in the children's area is in big trouble because we do not have children coming. We have staff ready to go. We have teachers that are fantastic, but we don't have children coming to Sunday school. Uh, most families are only giving us maybe one hour a week. And actually the average is, is probably less than that. Now there's some of you who are here four or five, 10 hours a week, and your hours go into that average of us not having people here. So where, where is the disconnect? I think some of it is, is relying to because we, don't need God as Americans. We do not need the power of God in our lives because we have things. We have, most of us have health care. Most of us never worry about food. Most of us have vehicles to get to and from work. And there's not this deep sense of need of God acting in our lives. But I want to challenge you. If you start doing those four things I mentioned earlier, you will see God began to transform you in a fantastic way. As I kind of leave you with my last story this morning of how God can act 
into the world when people actually invite God in. I was in seminary just last week, a couple years ago, maybe longer than that. It's been a while. I was in seminary at one point, right? Back in the road <coughs> I was there, I was there. And uh, college was fantastic. College for me was a breeze. Had a great time. Um, did pretty well academically. Took a lot of classes. You know, I love I loved learning. Went to seminary, and it was a whole different ball field. I tell you what, man, it was academically it was hard. It was challenging, and I'm like, you know, I tried to take Hebrew during the summer. Don't ever do that. You need like it's too much information at one time, and your brain explodes. And that's probably part of my problem now is Hebrew. But anyway, uh, seminary days. Um, struggled, you know, first year kind of financially until I found jobs and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, not worried about that. But when we got there, you'd think that seminary would be holy ground, right? That all of a sudden everybody's super Christian and we're like all in, to, you know, really letting the God do God's thing. And I'm like, no, it was not like that at all. I mean, further from the truth. So one night, um, me and two other guys who eventually became our roommates, we got together and we said, there's something missing. There's, there's, where's the spiritual part of seminary? So let's get together and pray. So he came to my room. I was in my room, like, uh, like most dorm rooms, it's probably, uh, probably 15 feet by eight feet across, you know, a bed, a desk, some counter space and a sink, and then a, a little, ba- well, the bathroom was on the hall. So um, pretty small for an area. So the three of us got in there, plenty of room. We got started praying. And then we said, hey, let's do this tomorrow night. This is great. Let's pray tomorrow. Let's pray tomorrow. And we started praying about every day, right? All of a sudden, within a couple of weeks or less than a month, there were 20 something people in my little dorm room praying. And our little prayer time went from like 30 minutes to like a couple of hours. I'm like, this is weird. So we're like, it's too many people. We're taking too much time, even though, you know, praying's good. No, don't get me wrong. But we decided that we would break off into small groups and people would go to different places on the campus and start more groups. There was a revival at a seminary when we were there. And it was all through these prayer groups that happened to start in my room. I don't take any responsibility for it other than the fact that we wanted to grow closer to God. We wanted to be transformed, not intellectually, not just intellectually as the, as the academics provided for, but we wanted to be spiritually transformed. We were praying for people and they were coming to us saying, hey, I've changed my behavior. I've changed my attitude. My sickness is gone. And guess what? We never told them at one time that we were praying for them. They just came up and let us know what God was doing in their life. And I'm thinking, if God can do that, if he can change people's lives through some simple prayer by people praying together, then what else can he do if we all get on the same page and we are of one mind and one heart? Regardless of differences, that doesn't mean that we can't disagree. Now, there's some of you I'm gonna disagree until I'm blue in the face with how you put something on you, okay? And there's some of you I'm just gonna love and and there's stuff you're gonna disagree with me on and that's okay. That doesn't mean that we are still not one in mind and in purpose. And that's where God wants us to be. And that's where we can be radically different in this culture that we live in. So I'm gonna ask you, how open are you to real transformation? How open are you to recognizing problems and being part of the solution instead of adding to to the problem? How many of you are concerned about what you see out in our country and then in the anger and the hate and then the violence that we have? Are you concerned about how we take care of this planet that we live on? Because God says a lot about that too. So I want to challenge you to think about how can we become even more transformational here? in this place where God has called us to be his community in hands, in his hands and his feet. The answer for all of us lies in our commitment to Christ and doing things that help us to stretch and to grow that are good and that are holy, like Kara this morning, of being willing to step up here in front of a bunch of scary people and lead us in worship. 
Can we do that kind of thing too? If you want to lead worship, let us know. We'll get you hooked up. But I'm thinking more than just that. Can we be bold and help our neighbors see that they are loved and they are cared for? Can we say that and do that for our community that's Harrisburg and Concord? God is alive and God can do amazing things through us if we allow his transformational spirit in our hearts. Will you pray with me? Gracious Lord, we thank you. Thank you so much for your word. It does challenge us. And sometimes we want to read it and like, oh, let's not talk about that. But God, we know that your power is greater than anything we can imagine. So help us to become transformational people, people who are changed and will cause good, healthy, holy, appropriate change in our communities. God, we thank you for what you're doing in our lives and our church. May we be faithful to you and may we start each with our own selves and our own hearts to build up and to encourage the kingdom that you called us to live in god help us not to continue down our present road but may there be revival and resurrection in our hearts a new commitment to you god where we don't turn our backs but we live out the gospel and everything and all that we do may it not be about us and about mine but may it be about you, God, and my neighbor. We thank you so much for your presence this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Too many papers. I invite you to stand for our last hymn this morning. Blessed be the ties that bind. So please stand as we sing our hymn, Blessed be the ties that bind. As you go forth this week, may God fill your life with his love, his grace, and his transformational processes that we would be someone different. May we look at each other differently and through new eyes. May we be faithful to you, God, in all that we do and all that we are. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Go in peace.